Hey, and welcome to the lecture. Before we jump into the learning, just a quick reminder to check out the workbooks available on modernoptician.com through the Ultimate Apprentice Optician Study Guide or available on Amazon worldwide. It's the best way to accompany this lecture so that you can fill in the blanks, label the diagrams, do everything all concurrently and elevate your training to the next level. All the links to the workbooks and the website are all in the description down below, so make sure to check it out. Other than that, enjoy today's lesson. All right, we are getting into the exciting part of this. Not that any, everything else wasn't exciting. However, the crystalline lens is going to be a very important lecture here. Then we're going to talk about some stuff. And again, we're not going to go too deep in this one because everything builds cumulatively in this. However, you're going to want to pay attention to this one so that you can better understand how the crystalline lens contributes to the visual process uh, and it's extremely important this is something that you need to know as an optician you should remember i said the cornea is like the holy grail well this is a close second and it might even compete because uh, i've mentioned this before if you can understand the process of accommodation and be an expert on it you're going to be in the one percentile of opticians uh, and accommodation comes from the crystalline lens so let's jump into it and uh, learn a little more about this so well once again here's the diagram of the eye and we will highlight the crystalline lens there it is in green and the crystalline lens is transparent and oblong in shape um why don't you think of this right we talk about refractive things uh actually you know what we haven't talked about in detail but we're going to touch on it but you know, the shape of things really have a huge impact on how um how it affects light so this is what we would call a biconvex lens you know two convex sides uh where's my pen there it is so this is a convex side and this is a convex side this creates quite a bit of power uh so and as we're going to discuss here it's able to change shapes and create even more so let's not go too deep let's just talk about it so the functions of the lens the fun is to refract light okay and to provide variations in focus through there it is accommodation right so the concept is is that by changing shape it changes the power which changes the focal length of the eye focal power and focal length and allows you to focus on near objects very interesting right so this our eye does this all on its own this is actually also an involuntary reflex also linked to the pupillary reflex because they all happen together remember perla i said pupils are equal round reactive to light and to accommodation it's called the triad of accommodation and the pupil is very closely linked to all of this now the resting power of the lens because it's not always flexed so the resting power of the lens is approximately 20 diopters and can add up to 15 diopters of converging power through accommodation so the optics of the eye in normal vision once again we are going to touch on this exactly the how you know all how all the structures of the eye converge light and the exact powers of everything and how it all works however for the time being i want you to think of this at rest it is contributing 20 diopters of power the cornea that we talked about contributes 40 to 43. so it's still a major player here even at rest it has it, it it absolutely is necessary to vision because it actually is one of the primary lenses that provide the power necessary to create that image on the retina as a matter of fact without getting too far ahead cataract surgery is when the lens gets kind of lousy cloudy and of course we'll use better terms when we get to it however years and years ago decades ago when they were doing cataract surgery and removing this lens they didn't have the technology to replace it we do now don't worry however at the time if you removed the crystalline lens you were subtracting 20 diopters of converging power from that eye which basically left the person impaired uh we therefore had to give them very strong glasses like plus 20 and beyond uh for some people and less for some people if they were myopic anyways we don't want to get too deep into that however the uh if you've never seen a plus 20 pair of glasses it ain't pretty uh fortunately we don't do that anymore we call those we call those people aphakic the term aphakic means no crystalline lens pseudophakic means they have a implant however aphakes when they used to come in to see you with these super strong prescriptions you had to give them like crazy ugly glasses uh again fortunately we are better than that now and we don't have to do it i don't you know what you may not even ever see an aphake in your career they still exist uh for whatever reasons you know if, if implants weren't an option however extremely rare 
Now, the lens itself has no blood supply or innervation. Uh, it depends entirely on the aqueous humor in the anterior chamber to meet its metabolic requirements. It's got to live, right? It's tissue. It needs nourishment. Uh, and we know that when things are avascular, just like a cornea, it needs uh, to get oxygen and nutrients from somewhere else. The cornea uses the tear film uh, and dissolved oxygen inside of that to be able to, to oxygenate itself. The crystalline lens is uh, encapsulated inside the eye. It gets everything from the aqueous humor. So obviously, again, uh, you know, shedding light on how important that aqueous humor production is um, because it's keeping things alive and nourished on the inside, right? So the lens is suspended in position by the, you might know this because we talked about it when we were talking about the ciliary body, by the suspensory ligaments, uh, which consists of delicate yet strong fibers that support and attach it to the ciliary muscle, right? Uh, look at that. It's all kind of blending together, right? So now we understand a little bit more about how the lens is suspended, uh, what it can do. We, we, we're not experts yet. However, we've got a little bit of an idea how things go. So why don't we take a look at the lens itself uh, so that we can have a little bit of a better kind of idea of what it's made up of. Uh, it's composed of four primary parts. So the nucleus will start at the center, the nucleus is in the center, and then the cortex surrounds the nucleus. Uh, then you've got the capsule, and then you've got the epithelium. Why do we need to know this? Well, you don't uh, per se. However, it does allow you to really understand things when we start getting deeper into the concept of cataracts. Another concept that is, I don't want to use the word epidemic because that word has become, has been thrown around a lot. However, it is extremely common. Uh, you know, you're going to see patients every day that have either had cataract surgery or currently have cataracts. When we talk about cataracts, we often talk about nuclear cataracts. We talk about cortical cataracts. And then there's another cataract that we talk about a little bit less, but it's, it's still prominent. Um, and it's a subcapsular uh, cataract. This a cataract is basically an opacification of one part of the lens that actually makes light not go through it nicely or, or at all sometimes if it's really advanced. Um, if you start hearing these terms, you can have an idea where they come from. A nuclear cataract starts from the center. It's, it starts from the nucleus. Uh, a cortical cataract starts in the, in the cortex. And a subcapsular one starts uh, in the capsule. All of these cataracts have different effects, have different kind of symptoms, and, it's, uh, and they are pretty important to understand um, so that you can have an idea of what the patient's symptoms are like. As a matter of fact, whenever I have patients that come out and say, ah, the doctor told me I had cataracts, I actually ask the doctor, what type of cataract? Because it has an impact on what their symptoms are going to be and it allows you to understand their perils. And if you're an optician who understands your patient, you're going to be well liked because if you can speak their language and, and, and you know, empathize with what the experience is, they're not only going to trust you because you know what you're talking about, but they're just going to like you better as a person because you seem to care. All right, I think that's enough for the structures of the crystalline lens because again, when we get into accommodation, we're going to be talking your ear off about the crystalline lens, so we don't need to get too deep on it right now. But again, you understand a heck of a lot more about it today than you did yesterday. And again, what is the op what is the significance to us as opticians? <laughs> accommodation, accommodation, accommodation. Remember, I've been telling you, accommodation is the most important concept that you're going to learn in a while, uh, and accommodation all happens in the crystalline lens, so it's. Uh, extremely important to know that structure and cataracts uh, you know the crystalline lens <clears throat> and where the cataract is, is happening uh, will impact the symptoms and then we have to think about the surgery we talked a little bit about what it means when you subtract that lens out of the eye and what needs to be done uh, the recovery as far as how vision kind of uh, changes after a uh, cataract surgery and the post treatment because as an optician the moment a person's had cataract surgery and is finished you know about a month or so afterwards after finished with the doctor they now become your responsibility and there's a lot of things that accompany cataract surgery most patient, patients come out of there thinking they're going to be cured and then they'll never need glasses again however there's concepts like presbyopia that if, that are from the the the, that stem from the crystalline lens um, and other refractive areas that are still present after. So they're, the, you know, their life in glasses is not necessarily done after cataract surgery. And we will touch on this a heck of a lot more when we start going over refractive error. We are not done with the crystalline lens. We're just talking about anatomy and physiology at the moment. We're going to start talking about optics and mechanisms in the future very soon. And we will revisit the crystalline lens uh, at that point. I think that does it for now. Um, actually, no, I think I have one. 
one more. Yes, because we just talk and we have to under sorry, the crystalline lens also has a huge impact in refractive air. And again, it's all about accommodation. Um, presbyopia, I just mentioned it. Also, hyperopia, which we will talk about soon, uh, has a huge link to the crystalline lens as well on how people can see despite their refractive error and how it kind of contributes to different you know, visual problems. So now I think we're done. Uh, that should do it for the crystalline lens and we will see you in the next one.